So at this stage, I'd just like to introduce uh, our second main speaker for this event. And I'm uh, very pleased to uh, uh, introduce a colleague of mine, Dr. Jer Jeremy Kurt. Uh, he has a long-standing passion for conservation and the search for answers uh, to broad-scale questions in ecology. His PhD was at York University, and it focused on how environmental factors affect diversity in ecosystems, and he began to address how human activities were actually affecting those patterns, and I suspect we'll be hearing some of that here today. Uh, this work led to the Governor General's Gold Medal and a postdoctoral uh, position at the University of Oxford with uh, Lord Robert May and Sir Richard Southwood, uh, people, at least ecologists, are very familiar with those two names, uh, where um, he expanded his focus on global change and the changing prospects for con conservation. Since joining the University of Ottawa Department of Biology in 2002, he has won a Provincial Early Researchers Award and the University of Ottawa Young Research Award in Science and Technology in 2009. He was elected to, uh, as a visiting senior research fellowship at Mansfield College and the Center for the Environment at the University of Oxford and was also selected for the uh, Global Young Academy of Science Scientists. Jeremy has worked to improve endangered species legislation in Ontario and through international programs such as the Boreal Science Panel to gain commitments from governments across Canada to establish uh, vast new protected areas in the boreal wilderness. His work remains focused on big questions in ecology and conservation, particularly uh, on how species respond to recent and rapid climate change and sharp, sharply rising incidents of climate-related extreme events. Uh, Jeremy's topic talk today is entitled Emerging Threats and Converging Responses, Challenges and Opportunities for Conservation in an Era of Global Change. Jeremy. Thank you very much, Professor Small. I'm going to try to actually keep time here, and it's not going to work because I'm using an analog um, watch. Uh, which reminds me of this Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy perspective on digital watches and my continued fascination with them um, probably puts me pretty low down on the food chain um, in terms of uh, Douglas Adams' view of, of humanity. Now let's see if I can make this actually work. There's always a chance. Okay, so I'm going to give you just a brief outline of some of the things that I'd like to talk about today uh, and we'll see if we run into any technical challenges that are related to my ongoing love of digital watches and also Macs. Uh, but I think we'll be all right. I'd like to talk about a couple of different aspects of global change. Uh, I am by no means going to discuss the full array of challenges that confront biodiversity, that confront people who are interested in conservation. Instead, I'm going to focus predominantly on habitat loss and climate change. These I, I view as a couple of emerging challenges and I will discuss the first of these, habitat loss, in terms of its impacts on patterns and causes of species endangerment across Canada. But many of the lessons that we gain from uh, study of these trends will apply almost anywhere else. A second emerging challenge, and, and as uh, Professor Small noted this morning, a very serious threat multiplier for us is that of climate change. And in Canada, of course, we are seeing the early evidence of climate change in a very substantial way. But then what I want to do is move past the array of challenges that confront us as people who are interested in conservation and in biodiversity and talk about some of the responses that we can use to try to improve our ability to meet those challenges. And this is where I'm going to get into what I'm, I'm going to call for today's talk, uh, converging responses, the idea that by marshalling ourselves in a couple of key ways, perhaps we can start to address some of these challenges more than merely one at a time. And that's one of the things that I think we need to do better. Um, and this in particular I will describe as uh, the need to engage Canadians in an ongoing conservation conversation. So say that ten times really fast and see how you do. I've managed it once and uh, I'm not sure I'll manage it again. And the second thing is is that as conservationists we have an opportunity, but perhaps in, indeed an obligation, to stop fighting a purely rearguard action in terms of meeting biodiversity needs, but start taking conservation um, actions in a more proactive kind of way. And I'll describe what I mean by that in a few moments. So a very, very short background on um, changing climate, one of the two emerging challenges that I'm going to discuss. 
Greenhouse gas emissions, um, which are linked through the isotopic fingerprints to human activities and the combustion of fossil fuels, um, have been increasing atmospherically. We're now between about 395 and 400 parts per million, depending on where on Earth you are. The Arctic, it was reported yesterday, has just reached 400 parts per million. In terms of uh, actual carbon dioxide equivalents, it's more like 450 because of the effects of other greenhouse gases. So the, the rate at which we're adding these radiative forcing agents to the atmosphere, and as again was described this morning, a kind of global dump for uh, the, the byproducts of society, is really high. That rate is very high. We know um, for a very large number of reasons that continued greenhouse gas emission is going to continue changing climates and that the number of consequences for this trend uh, is huge. It's a, a very pervasive cross-cutting and indeed threat multiplying phenomenon. One of the many things which concern us as people who study global change is that when at equilibrium or something like it. Uh, the last time global planetary temperatures were two degrees Celsius warmer than they are today, this is a couple million years before present, or BP, sea level was 25 meters higher. Now it takes a long time for sea level to respond to climate change, but if that's the direction we're headed, then we have a problem, and it wouldn't be very sensible for us to fail to address it. Okay, there we go. There are uh, very, very wide um, arrays of evidence that climate scientists and a, a host of other scientists have marshaled to make the case for climate change. And, and this is a kind of framework which is very instructive for us in ecology because it's a very young science and one that substantially lacks some of these unifying physical principles. We can learn a lot from how some of these arguments and arrays of evidence have been assembled. And in terms of some of the basic things that we know, one of them is that atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations have been increasing. This is simply undisputable point uh, measured using the, the very famous Keeling curve in the upper right-hand corner of this, um, of this slide. Through an extremely complicated array of models, we have a sense for the impacts of what happens atmospherically when you add those radiative forcing agents, those when you thicken the blanket of greenhouse gases atmospherically over the surface of the Earth, temperature increases. And the only way using any physical-based um, model to retrieve actually observed temperatures is to include the effects of those human-emitted greenhouse gases. So there is a subsequent model which is based on physical principles and draws on experimental observations of the warming impacts of carbon dioxide that we can then use to parameterize a rather complicated model that gives us an, a picture of what climate should be doing if we omit the impacts of greenhouse gases, and that's what this blue thing is down here, and then what climate is actually doing with the impacts of those greenhouse gases added in, and that's this red and pink stuff up here, and then the black line is what's actually happening. And this is an extremely powerful test for us to show that these scientific models have a grip on reality. And the need for us to have that grip is acute. Now the other thing that's very cool about climate science and the many ancillary um, disciplines that have drawn on these foundational principles is that they make an enormous number of secondary predictions, every single one of which appears to be matching expectations. And here's one of the many examples that if we're going to increase temperatures, then we ought to be observing secondary effects in terms of losing things like the Arctic ice cap, which is by any standard a very, very bad thing. Uh, it's one of the, the ways of pushing the fast forward button on climate change. But nevertheless, we can test predictions like this and look at trends, and that's the trend over the last few decades. And it matches expectations rather closely, and of course it does other things like can decrease the albedo at the, the North Pole. So, each of these data sets, another characteristic of them that's important for us as ecologists, is that each of these data sets is temporal. It runs through time. It isn't just a spatial snapshot at any given moment. It is parameterized and operates like a clockwork through time and gives us accurate reconstructions of what we have actually observed to be happening. And this is, of course, the sine qua non of good science. Now, another 
really important emerging challenge for us, and from a biodiversity point of view, at this, at this juncture in history, probably the greater challenge is that of habitat loss and habitat modification. This is the global human footprint integrating terrestrial and marine and, well, partially aquatic, but mostly just terrestrial and marine environments at a global scale. And what it shows you is the relative depth of human footprints around the world. So places that are these darker shades of orange and red are places where humans have directly modified the terrestrial land surfaces. And you can see the impacts of those human activities from space. Now, one of the interesting things that emerges from these satellite-based uh, geographic information system analyses is that Canadians enjoy an extremely unusual kind of environment where much of our country actually qualifies and meets the technical definitions of wilderness. About two-thirds of the country, it turns out, meet many of the standard definitions for wilderness, a substantial extent of roadless areas, for instance, and large tracts of land, which are uh, distant from any visible human disturbance. And of course, this comes with the important caveat that other aspects of global change, like the redistribution of contaminants that are caught in things like the polar vortex, these contaminants are pervasive, and even in the most remote wildernesses on Earth, you will still find traces of their presence, and their impacts are not small. So that sort of thing is excluded from this. This is just measuring the visible impact of habitat loss. And of course, we know from Justina Ray's excellent talk this morning that the impacts of humans extends pervasively across marine environments as well. So we see that in terms of things like the decline of things like cod stalks but among the many other fisheries in the world, nearly three quarters of them are currently in decline. So we see that at a global scale, and all of this has led us to um, the recent proposition that we are no longer in something approximating a natural geological era, as Professor Small pointed out. We are now entering what will probably officially be known as the Anthropocene. Um, and that is to say that human footprints, in terms of altering the flow of materials and energy at a global scale, are now the dominant forces shaping those flows. And needless to say, this has very substantial impacts on our prospects for conservation. And that's where, as an ecologist and as a conservation biologist, my main passion lies. So, one of the things that you might think is that, given the pervasiveness and depth of human footprints, that there would be substantial biodiversity responses, and indeed, that is true. What this map shows you is from a paper we published about eight years ago. Um, in various shades of pink, because Canadians have this traditional view of themselves as slightly pink, um, <laughs> is the density of an American certainly do. So this would be all just shades of deep red from an American view. Um, but this shows us variation in numbers of species at risk that are found within little spatial sampling units across the country. Those sampling units are watersheds. It doesn't really matter what they are. It just basically shows you that there's an enormous gradient in the numbers of species at risk across Canada. And as you go towards southern regions, like around here, or a little further south in Ontario, you reach areas which are biodiversity hotspots, but also species endangerment hotspots. The numbers of species at risk in the south is far higher than it is in the north, even though the popular perception of biodiversity is that nature is something you have to travel by car to go see a few hours away. Which is an interesting and dissonant view, given that many of our most imperiled species are our neighbors in urban areas. So this also shows in these little green splotches here uh, the distribution of many of Canada's protected areas. Uh, we have, of course, many iconic parks in Canada in many different categories. And there are some truly beautiful ones up in this neck of the woods. But one of the things that you'll notice is that the Switzerland-sized parks, they're actually the size of Switzerland, uh, they tend to be in places where biodiversity is relatively low. But also, the conservation need is not at its most acute. We protect areas which are beautiful wilderness and have amazing vistas, but they are rarely our biodiversity hotspots. And this creates a problem for us if our key conservation response to biodiversity needs is to build a park. So we've tended in, in the past for very sensible reasons. Um, not ideal from a science point of view, but very understandable reasons to put those parks in places where they would not do that much biodiversity good 
Now, one of the things, that, of course, that's a problem, and it's a theme that's going to come back, I'm sure, several more times today, is Canada is losing its capacity for environmental monitoring. This is a satellite, the first ever land cover land use uh, data set compiled synoptically for Canada uh, based on a satellite called Spot 4 Vegetation um, that we published in 2003. And what it shows you is the beautiful heterogeneity that Canada has, but it also gives you without this legend may really making it all that clear, a very um, transparent measurement that anybody can look at and understand about where the habitat loss impacts are most serious. So what this shows us is the outline of places like our agricultural regions in the prairies and in southern Ontario, almost all of which have been converted to some form of agricultural land use. And this represents a very serious threat for us in terms of conserving our species at risk. And that right now I'm talking about federal species at risk, but these lessons apply within individual provinces with almost no change. So the other thing that's on here is this graph that shows you that as you increase the extent of human modified lands within the ecozones of Canada, of which at the time we published this there were 15, as you increase the area of those uh, human modified landscapes, you increase the numbers of species at risk that are within them. So this is just to make the point in yet another way that habitat <laughs> loss has serious impacts for us in terms of our prospects for conserving Canada's biodiversity. Now here's another kind of view of things and what this is meant to do is measure the, using satellite data again, is measure the extent of natural habitat that remains within the historical ranges for Canada's species at risk. So what you'll see on the x-axis is the amount of that range which continues as apparently natural habitat. Um, so places, and, then, and, and um, this is just the number of species that fall into each of those categories. So the, the biggest bar here is the one where zero to five percent of the historical distribution of that species now is recognizable from space as a natural habitat and of those quite a lot of them have no measurable habitat at all so using coarse resolution satellite data you actually can see no place they could possibly be living you have to be on the ground to find the little corner of the woodlot and the three square meters of that plant population's current distribution in canada you can't see it from space so what this suggests to us, I'd like to say this is an opportunity, not a problem, um, because we have a chance to do a lot of good through habitat restoration. So that's, that's a completely lame attempt to spin this as somehow a positive message. Um, but nevertheless, I'm going, to, I'm going to dive valiantly on this hill that this is an opportunity, um, it's also a problem, but it's, it's something that we have clearly the potential to make a lot of progress with, let's put it that way. It suggests we have a lot of recovery potential, there's a lot of elasticity um, in the system in terms of what we can accomplish by restoring natural habitat to the historic ranges of these species. Clearly this is not such a trivial thing. But one of the problems that we run into, of course, is that habitat loss is not partitioned into neat bite-sized chunks that you can just flip a switch and turn back into natural habitat. If a lot of the historic ranges of species have been consumed for purposes of things like Toronto, then that's going to present, well, except for City Hall, which I think is almost totally expendable. Um, there's not that much uh, latitude for bulldozing chunks of Toronto and turning it into Prairie or oak savanna woodland, for instance. So what we need to do is understand how that habitat loss is partitioned between urban areas and agricultural areas. Agricultural areas are far easier to work with because the cost of infrastructure in those landscapes is much less and there's a great deal more flexibility with landowners and multiple stakeholders to enable us to make progress on restoration. And there is some argument in the literature subsequent to our initial work suggesting agriculture was really the key issue, that urban areas might actually be just about, have just about the same importance. And if that's true, then, then we've got a problem. Our elasticity for restoration kind of goes away because it's just 
it's almost impossible to restore large urban areas. So what this pair of maps actually shows us is the average amount of habitat lost to agriculture, and that's on the left-hand side, um, measured across these watersheds or, or uh, actually eco-districts uh, across Canada, and the numbers range between zero and about 90% of species ranges within those eco-districts being lost to habitat, lost to agriculture. Now, if you go to the right-hand side, you get the same sort of um, trends where it's mostly in the south that habitat loss exerts its most serious impacts, and indeed it's very highly concentrated in what is, uh, for reasons I don't quite get, called the golden horseshoe. Um, plus certainly not good luck for species. Um, but these areas down here around Toronto and Hamilton, this is an area where the impacts of urban habitat loss in that location are extreme. But the extent of habitat lost for the species that exist there, on average, is rather low because they are also present or were historically present in other areas. So although the footprint in that spot is high, the total impact for the species present in those places is relatively small, which is not to say the area is unimportant. But the scale here goes to a far smaller number than it does over here where it's 90. This goes to 5% or, 5 or so. So rather small numbers in terms of the relative impacts of urban areas. Now the one thing that's really important to note is that although the spatial extent of urban areas in Canada is considerably less than 10% of the extent of agricultural areas, we put almost all of our city in the mid almost all of our cities in the middle of Canada's biodiversity hotspots. Toronto is smack dab in the middle of the biodiversity hotspot. London, Ontario right at the boundaries of Carolinian Canada, right in the middle of the biodiversity hotspot. We put Victoria on top of the biodiversity hotspot of western British Columbia, it took out Carrier of Woodlands almost completely. Um, same thing in southwestern prairies where we see urban areas smack dab in the middle of biodiversity hotspots in that part of Canada. So the relative impact of these is actually larger than their footprint suggests. So the impact of urban areas is more like a third is important, even though the relative extent of those urban areas is really much less than 10% of the size of, of agricultural areas. So agriculture has a much larger impact than urban areas, but the relative impacts are closer together than you might expect because of the situation of those urban areas. Now what this suggests for us, since we don't have to get rid of Toronto, I mean, you can decide yourselves what you think you should do with Toronto, but we don't have to get rid of Toronto to conserve species in Canada. We do have some flexibility in other areas. The first frontier for conservation is habitat recovery. Species recovery represents, it's not the last thing we should be thinking about. We really have to move past this view of always trying to just save the remnants. Because by the time we have got the patient on the table at that point, they're near death. And what we need to do is get them healthy again, not just try to stop the bleed. So conservation too often acts as a bandage. Now one of the opportunities we have then is to start thinking about places where restoration is feasible. And one of the things that you can do to make rapid progress on issues like this is try to figure out what are the areas where agriculture is at its most marginal, where the economic benefits of agriculture are really, really small and producers are not gaining very much income from their lands. These are the areas where if we work with those landowners, perhaps we can convert some of those lands to conservation purposes. And it turns out that if you start doing these trade-offs where you can restore habitat for species at risk in areas where agriculture is at its least valuable for the producers who are working those lands, then maybe you can make a fairly substantial amount of progress relatively easily. So this is one of the things that you can do. You can actually work out an optimal solution. This is a numeric, kind of a, just a big quantitative thing that runs in a computer. And what it does is it works out the balance between minimizing the economic costs of setting aside new areas not already protected 
for restoring species at risk. So it maximizes those benefits, or sorry, it maximizes the numbers of species at risk that you can restore habitat for while minimizing the economic cost of doing so in terms of what Statistics Canada measures as the value of agriculture in those regions. And what this measures is, is not the income, but actually the total value of everything on those lands. And this is the array of areas that you end up with. You can make a huge impact. Almost all of Canada's species at risk can have some of their habitat restored by selecting from among these little black specks in the southern biodiversity hotspots. So you can make a lot of progress in relatively quick order. Here's the second uh, perspective at um, looking at this issue um, in a different way. So there's two ways of doing this. One, you can buy the farm. And I don't mean that in the figurative sense, uh, although I imagine some of our federal counterparts wish we would. Um, the other thing you can do is you can replace the income from those agricultural regions. And so you can calculate the cost of protecting these species at risk, and you can say, okay, well, we'll actually set aside as much as, say, 10% of lands that are currently under the plow. And you can calculate the cost in terms of replacing the income from those agricultural lands as it's measured by Statistics Canada. So but what the producers actually say they make in those lands. And you can actually restore something like 10% of this habitat, or at least set those areas aside for relatively marginal costs. This is about a fifth of one F-35. Um, so one F-35 will get you out here. But a fifth of one, that'll buy you five years of, uh, of access to those lands for conservation. So I figure about three F-35s are good to go. So you can target the least profitable areas that are producing almost no income for farmers, where they are having a hard time keeping their heads above water anyway. Replace that income for those producers. Work with landowners, and this needs to be a respectful and two-way dialogue. Talking at private landowners is a recipe for disaster and should not be pursued. It should only be done in a respectful two-way dialogue. You can make an awful, an awfully large amount of progress in relatively short order by simply engaging with people who might actually be inclined to help you if you just ask nicely. A lot of species in Canada have virtually no remaining habitat. This is, uh, it's not a good thing, but it certainly gives us an opportunity to do good things. Uh, agricultural land conversions in Canada are rather more extensive than urban areas. They're vastly more extensive, and their impacts are greater. And it is in those areas where we have some potential to make progress with small amounts of effort. We don't have to revolutionize society to turn this ship around to a substantial degree. And that perception that absolutely everything must change for us to make reasonable amounts of progress is very corrosive to the conservation enterprise. In landscapes like this, this is probably Canada's hottest biodiversity hotspot in terms of numbers of species and numbers of species of risk. It's just south of Toronto near Long Point Bird Observatory, which is just off the bottom end of the screen here. This is maybe 25 or 30 percent woodland. This is a place called um, the St. Williams for, uh, Crown Reserve now. The numbers of species at risk in this woodland is huge, and they are by and large in reasonably stable shape, by and large. This is not to say that this is enough habitat to keep those species, but if you measure all of the woodlands across this landscape and manage them in a sensible way, much progress can be made with relatively little effort. We don't have to completely change everything. But this is where I'll start discussing the other of our emerging challenges. And this has got to do with climate change. For a biodiversity person, for a conservation biologist, for an ecologist, climate affects everything. It is the structure within which ecosystems are constructed. It is vital to virtually every aspect, directly or indirectly, of ecosystems and their services and functions that people rely on. And it's a terribly complicated phenomenon. Because it affects everything directly and indirectly and through interactive effects, it's very difficult to disentangle many of its most complicated impacts on species. So I'd like to draw the analogy with butterflies because I like butterflies. Um, and it gives me an excuse to show high resolution photographs of butterfly wings, which I also like to do. This is a, an African monarch butterfly, very much like our Danaeus uh, here, the, the, North American, the North American monarch. 
And you can look at this butterfly wing in the same sort of way that you look at climate change impacts. You can see it from a distance and kind of look at it telescopic way and see the whole wing and think, well, that's pretty amazing. There's a lot of detail there, but what I really notice is that there's a big orange butterfly sitting in the grass. But then you can zoom in and say, well, you know what? Some of those details are actually kind of remarkable because I can see that there's little white bits over here that I really couldn't see when I was zoomed out. And this black margin is thick here and it's thinner here and it's really thin here. What's going on? Something interesting. And then you zoom in a lot more and what you see is that the wings are covered in really small scales. They're not quite microscopic, but they're very small. And the question for us in thinking about the impacts of climate change is, is what happens when we start messing around with the scales on this wing? Are there little bits of the, the big picture of climate change where if we change just a few small things, everything about that picture for climate change will consequently change itself, will affect biodiversity in some profound way. And you can see that the whole picture for what this butterfly might look like would be, would be a little bit different if you just picked up 25 or 30 of the scales from this orange bit and stuck them in the middle of one of these white spots. You'd see that right away with the naked eye from 25 feet. These kinds of impacts, and I'm going to stop pushing this butterfly wing analogy now, because it's really gratuitous and I just like butterflies, it's really what I'm doing. <laughs> All of this is to say that many of the climate change impacts that we ought to be very concerned about are going to be complex. Uh, Dr. Ray this morning spoke about the nonlinearity of these changes, and this is absolutely true. And one of the things that we're not going to be good at predicting is, is where we hit those thresholds and where we cross tipping points into new regimes. That's the sort of thing we ought to be concerned about. But the point of all of that is to say that climate change responses are complex, and we nevertheless can build a response uh, scientifically that lets us predict some of those responses, how some of the changes that climate change will wreak upon the species that we're concerned with. So you can do things like look at century-long time scales for butterflies in Canada and say, okay, based on the historical distributions for these species and what we think the dependencies are for that species on climate, and based on where climates have changed the most in Canada, where do we think that species should have gone over the course of the 20th century across the country? And you can make your model run forward in time, just like the climate science models that I showed you earlier on. You can do the same sorts of things from an ecological point of view. And you can run those models through time. And then the key, I mean, that's the easy bit. That's it's just like flying a remote control airplane. It's not all that cool. But what you can then do, and this is the important bit, is test it against observations. You run your model through the 20th century to the end, and that's roughly these days. Um, and then you, you check to see whether the model is right. And if the species went to the places where it is now being observed, then you know the model has some sort of grip on the real world. And that's the test of whether or not science is doing something right. And this work is possible because of the establishment, rather organically, of what amounts to a monitoring system for butterflies across Canada. It just turns out there's enough people in the country who think butterflies are cool that they went out and they collected butterflies for the past century. And it's not the same person, obviously. And that lets us do this kind of work. The presence of that monitoring gives us the capacity to provide foresight about the impacts of climate change. The converse is also true. No monitoring means no foresight. And that's an important message to remember for the present day. But what it all really boils down to is whether or not what we predicted should happen matches the observations. That's the test. That's whether or not that tells you whether science is doing something right or whether it's just a bunch of complicated models with, with difficult to parameterize variables in them and it's not really working. If it works, these ought to be straight lines. And it turns out that in this case, if you try to predict what butterflies have been doing across the country in terms of their geographical range responses to changing climates, that we predicted they would move around in certain ways, and then you go and you check those places for where they've actually gone during that same time period, 
The predictions and the observations match rather closely. We've done it in multiple ways. This shows you a couple of different ways here. One, a very generalized statistical one, one a bit more sophisticated in terms of its ingredients. The point of this is to say that although climate change exerts effects in many ways, and many of those effects are complex, nevertheless, some of the most important ones can be predicted. And this gives us the capacity to improve our foresight about what those impacts may look like as climate continues to change in the coming decades. And it will. So, so far. For some species groups, the geographical responses to climate changes have been rapid, but they have nevertheless responded in ways that ultimately proved amenable to scientific analysis, contingent on the availability of decent monitoring data to let us test those models. But one of the things that's really important to understand is that many of these species are nevertheless challenged by both the rate and the magnitude of climate change. So climate is changing fast, and it's changing a lot. And Canada has seen climate change earlier and more substantially than almost any other place in the world. What will happen to species confronted with climate changes that outstrip their capacity to respond? And the short answer is we don't really know, um, but we'd better find out, because we could very well be, and there's a lot of science to suggest that this could be true, we could very well be poised right at the brink of a rapid acceleration of extinction rates, and purely from habitat loss, we are already in the realm of a mass extinction. The last thing we want to do is make that go even faster. The other thing to note about climate change, this is an important lesson from paleoecology, is that climate change is not merely a gradual shift in mean conditions. People talk about things like, well, four degrees Celsius, what does that mean to me? Four or five degrees Celsius is the average temperature difference between 50 years ago and the height of the last ice age. Five degrees Celsius warmer than 50 years ago is a world that humanity has precisely zero evolutionary experience with, and many of the species that we share this planet with also do not. So that's something we should be concerned with. The other thing is that as climate changes, you're not just shifting the means, you're shifting the frequency and intensity of extreme events. Some of those events can be violent in terms of their impact, and that presents risks for biodiversity also. It's very difficult for us to come to grips with some of these things. Now, one of the things that we've observed recently, and this was alluded to earlier in a really excellent way by Dr. Dr. Ray, um, is that we are seeing the rapid declines recently of some of our most important species from an ecosystem service point of view. These are species like bumblebees, and in this instance I'll talk about one of these species, which is Bombus aphanus, and here I'm happy to acknowledge uh, the contributions of Sheila Collett, who's joined us today. Uh, he's done just extraordinary work on uh, bumblebee conservation in Canada and internationally, and this relies on a lot of her data and expertise. So this work is looking at the historical distribution of this bumblebee and identifies the climatic factors that have affected the distributional limits for this species. Basically, the boundaries of its niche space measured in terms of climate. And historically speaking, its geographical distribution looked something like this, this kind of funny misty thing, which gives you relative habitat suitability for it, and this matches its historical distribution almost perfectly. Now, this is about 2 million square kilometers, and within that range, it was a very, very common bumblebee species, one of the most common, historically speaking. Now, one of the questions for us is, what happened to the rusty patch bumblebee? This thing went from common as dirt to practically extinct, and it did so over the course of perhaps 15 years. Uh, starting around about, but no one's exactly sure of exactly this tipping point, but around about 1989 or 1990, this bumblebee started declining precipitously, went from really common to practically gone. How come? Well, one of the things that we hypothesized here was that maybe something about these violent mood swings, these rapid increases in the extremity of climate events, has started to play some role that we can actually measure in terms of the decline of species. Now this was highly speculative work, stuff that I began while on sabbatical last year, and what it suggests to us is that maybe some of the things that really matter for these species are not so much the mean conditions, 
but the intensity of the extremes. And that intensity is increasing through time. Now, one of the ways that, of course, you want to make sure as a scientist that the work you're doing has some meaningful grip on reality is to test those models using observations. So we built a historical model that identifies those niche constraints, and we ran it through 45 years of annual observations for this species to see whether or not the species was found in places the model said it should be in, and whether or not it was absent from places the model said it wouldn't like to live. And it turns out that you have about 90, 98% accuracy. The species is practically never found in places the model says are not good, and is almost only ever found in places that it says it is. So, the other things, of course, that are going on here, oh, so this gives us a basic sense that these models of species distribution have a capacity to tell us what this species does with respect to climate, how climate affects it, because we ran it through time and compared it against observations for this long period. The other things, of course, that are going on are in terms of pesticide use, habitat loss, bee diseases, and we looked at those factors independently, and that's in a second paper with um, a PhD student of mine, but also Sheila and conservation letters that shows that these effects are, uh, are not significant for this particular bee. Now, one of the things that comes up is when you run these models on short time scales, keyed to the life expectancy of the queen bees, as opposed to the 30-year averages of climate that we typically see, then what you get is that annually, there's a huge amount of variability. This is the historical distributional kind of suitability zone for this species from 1931 to 1960. And you run that through very short time periods. And this is one of the hottest years on record. It's about the third hottest year on record, 1998. And what you find is that most of its historically occupied uh, zone becomes unsuitable in that year, if the model is correct. So there's a lot of variability from year to year, and this goes up and it goes down. There's good years and there's bad years. But one of the things that's interesting is that the rate at which, or the, the magnitude at which it, it goes up and it goes down, that is habitat suitability increases or decreases, has gone up by something like 600% since about 1989. So you compare that against historical baselines, and again, a reference to historical baselines this morning was extremely important. This idea that these baselines are shifting around is really a difficult problem for us. So we compared what variability looks like in recent time periods to what it looked like historically, and what we got is that it's increased by about 600%. We're getting a rapid succession of really, really bad years from a climatic point of view for this bee species. And what we think might be happening is a couple of different things. The growing season is getting longer, which causes some of these bees to emerge a bit earlier, but that renders them at increasing susceptibility to very unusual and intense spring storms. So queens, as they move around in these landscapes after emerging in the spring, are potentially at least being hit by some of these extreme precipitation events, and that may be hindering their potential to establish new colonies or wiping them out. Now the other thing is the, the species is not actually quite extinct yet. There are a few places where it persists. Those places show no trend in variability. Those places are not getting more variable through time, but we know at the same time those populations have gotten smaller. And if you look at what's actually happening in terms of mean habitat suitability in those regions, that suitability is declining. So in, in regions where the bee yet persists, its populations are declining in exactly the direction predicted by these models. So there is at least a case to be made, and I don't want to argue that this is proven or anything. I think there's a lot of discussion that should be had around these issues. But there is a case that can be made that increasing incidence of climatic extremes is contributing to the decline of at least some of our pollinator species. And where this will take us in the near future is highly uncertain. But what is clear is that we are seeing increasing climatological mood swings, if you will, as, as we have seen in the paleoecological record, that eras in which climate changes are accompanied by really dramatic extreme events. And it's just becoming very common for us now to have two years in ten with century floods or century heat waves. And I think you all remember the kind of crazy weather that we had in March this year. And for those of you who are into skiing, you will have been disappointed to find that all the snow melted very quickly. 
in the middle of March, which really is not a bad time of year to go skiing. So after getting back to Canada, I was very annoyed to find my ski season um, abruptly ended by one of these crazy mood swings, an absolutely record-breaking heat wave that broke records by about 10 degrees Celsius on some days uh, for about two weeks, where it was like 25 degrees and everyone's wearing shorts and a t-shirt in the middle of March in Canada. It's not really part of our proper... It was just pretty freaky. Now, these kinds of mood swings are important for us because they have impacts. They're changing our ecosystems. They are affecting our species, and they're affecting us as well. Now, one of the interesting things, of course, in terms of converging responses, and this is just to introduce the idea of some of the things we can do to deal with these problems, is that governments in Canada are currently acting, and this is just simply, I, this is so self-evident that it's, it's sort of hard to argue with, but governments in Canada are acting to dismember environmental monitoring programs and long-term monitoring sites. Um, they're just simply being ended. There's no discussion about it, and it is abundantly clear um, by looking at the way these policies are being shaped, and shaped that there is no thought about it either. Um, we are losing the ability, in other words, to measure whether or not the problems that confront us are getting worse or if they're getting better. And if we don't know what direction these problems are going, it's going to be extremely difficult for us to formulate policy responses for them, and some of our colleagues have suggested that this is indeed part of the strategy. If you don't know what's going on, it won't bug you. Now one of the things that you ought to know is that ignoring real world trends doesn't mean that real world trends will ignore you. Now you can pretend that climate isn't changing, but it was still 25 degrees Celsius in March and you were wearing shorts. Now the real world exists regardless of whether you decide to stop measuring, measuring it or not. And that's something that strangely uh, seems increasingly difficult to convey to policymakers in Canada. So, one of the converging responses is to make conservation part of our day-to-day -day conversations with policymakers, but also among citizens who are not scientists by training, but maybe are interested in the natural world for other reasons. Now, what if we could persuade citizens to fill part of the data gap being left by the abrupt closure of some of our, our most impressive long-term scientific establishment sites like the Experimental Lakes area. What if there was a way that we could at least engage citizens in part of this ongoing conversation? One of the things that I will contend here is that people conserve what they care about, and they care about things that they see. And if we can get them to do that, then maybe we can get them to join this conservation conversation. Last time I'll try to say that. One of the things that we've tried to do recently is to establish a means for this to happen in terms of monitoring biodiversity in Canada. And we started with butterflies, which has rather broad engagement uh, among Canadians. And what we did was that about a month and a half ago, we launched a website called eButterfly.ca. This is reflecting the really impressive efforts of a postdoctoral researcher of mine named uh, Dr. Maxim uh, Larive. And there was a huge amount of interest in this. And one of the really exciting things about this citizen science website, we launched on April 16th. On April 18th, the largest butterfly migration in history, by perhaps a factor of 10, began across southern Ontario. Now, we launched this website, and immediately, hundreds of people, and at the time, it seemed like hundreds of media outlets, were just freaking out about butterflies. There's butterflies everywhere, red admirals all over the place. Now, what we were able to do by engaging Canadians in southern Canada and eastern Canada especially in the citizen science project was actually track in near real time the advance of this tidal wave of butterflies across southern Canada. So we were extremely lucky in that one, in that one sense of being in the right place at the right time. It's this a very historic event and this year continues to be an extremely good year for butterflies. So go join eButterfly.ca and, and submit your observation of butterflies, please. They're cool, and you can take zoomed-in photographs of their wings, and it's great. <laughs> I've, I'm such a geek. <laughs> but it has been really, really rewarding, and it, it has also been a really educational experience for us, because one of the things that surprised us was how much people wanted to do this. 
there were radio stations in Hamilton that called us and did interviews and on butterflies. I mean, who gets primetime interviews on butterflies? It makes no sense. But it turns out that Ed Wilson's biophilia hypothesis is probably true. But you have to give people a way to engage in that conversation. And eButterfly.ca is just one of the many ways that this can proceed. And there are a lot of other efforts that many other scientists and interested naturalists have begun that help these conversations to become part of our everyday dialogue. And if we make that part of our dialogue, it has the potential to become part of dialogue with policymakers, and they'll stop ignoring it systematically. Now, one of the neat things about this site is you can track these observations in near real time. And I won't get into this very much. This is the sort of thing that let us track the wave of these butterflies. We could compare it against prevailing wind patterns and so on and measure the rate, the area, and the estimated population size. We took a wild guess, and it was a wild one. About 300 million butterflies were involved. So pretty cool. And there were people who reported on the order of tens of thousands of these, these red admiral butterflies uh, up in trees. Now, the other converging response, so one of the converging responses, something that will help us solve many environmental problems is to engage people with, an, to, to gain an interest in solving those problems. But yet another one is to add to our conservation arsenal the idea that we don't always have to be just reactive in terms of addressing needs. Maybe there are opportunities for us to step ahead of the curve, be proactive, and start setting aside big areas before they become critically endangered. So we know that habitat loss and climate change have had major impacts on conservation in Canada. Maybe there's a chance for us to get ahead of that curve in certain parts of this country before those areas are comparably threatened as they are in southern Canada. This is an example of a very interesting phenomenon that took place a couple of years ago, almost exactly two years ago now, this Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement. Part of a, a number of different efforts uh, at the provincial level and to some extent at the federal level to set aside wilderness areas in the north or the far north before those areas were substantially modified through industrial activities. Now one of the interesting things also about this agreement is that if you spoke to some of the players at the time the agreement was launched and announced, government was not part of the discussion. Uh, and the reason that government was not part of the discussion is that they were not viewed as constructive. Now that's an interesting turn for us, isn't it? Government being no longer viewed as an authority to be consulted on these issues, very powerful, but they've undermined their authority in some instances by pushing overtly ideological agendas that are not productive, that industry finds very unhelpful, that subverts industry's social license to operate. We see this in the oil sands where, uh, to my great surprise, we apparently have a relatively progressive government, which is actually engaging with industry to try to solve some of the really basic issues of just having an effective monitoring system. For those of you who were here a couple of years ago, Professor Schindler spoke about this issue. So it was interesting, government was excluded from this agreement. It was directly industry to environmental NGOs. But the upshot of this agreement and Ontario's Far North Act and Quebec's Plan Nord and some other efforts in Manitoba, east of Lake Winnipeg, and up in the territories, has been to set aside vast areas of wilderness in, in parks. And this will have a huge benefit. So this gets us ahead of the curve. It's a response that will help us with habitat loss. It will prepare us to conserve things better in the face of climate change. It's helpful in every possible way. It's also helpful, we hope, um, with, for First Nations who are present in the North who may find that they have a, a, a longer lasting relationship with industrial interests that they welcome into their territories instead of having those entities kind of parachuting in and taking what they need and leaving to something that's been a pattern in the past. So in conclusion, the emerging threats of habitat loss and climate change have, have accelerated extinction rates enormously by how much is a difficult thing for us to measure precisely, but it's certainly by a couple orders of magnitude, arguably three orders of magnitude. We need 
to deal with these challenges more than one at a time. Piecemeal responses to these emerging threats has not been effective. There are opportunities for us to take to solve small problems and we should pursue those whenever we have the chance. But we also have opportunities to change the conversation in a bigger kind of way. And when we have those converging response opportunities, we should pursue those too. One of the things we can do is engage in respectful, lasting conversations that can involve education, that can involve citizen science, make people part of the solution, but also part of the dialogue. Scientists have a kind of pulpit, here I am. Um, but it's, it's by no means exclusive, and everybody's voice can be part of these discussions. And proactive conservation is an addition to our array of tools in conservation, something where we can occasionally get ahead of the curve. And when we have those opportunities, we need to take them, because they will vanish. If we waited 20 years to do some of this work in the boreal, we would have lost our opportunity to accomplish what we did. And I say we involved me virtually not at all, as most of the other people. But what the big we actually managed to get done required that opportunity. So an acknowledgement, uh, first I'd like to acknowledge the First Nation whose traditional territory this is. Um, they should be recognized. And Jim Rusak, uh, Judy Brouse, and the organizers of the 2012 Muskoka Biodiversity Summit, or Summit of Biodiversity Laws. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy, and I will open up. Before I ask my question, I just wanted to say that a few things you said resonated with me. A first um, is the when you said that the government's dismantling the monitoring departments. Every Environment Canada office that I've worked for in the past no longer exists. From the Ecological Monitoring Assessment Network to the Biodiversity Convention Office to the entire Ecosystem and Biodiversity Priorities Division, they're gone. <laughs> And uh, people that are still in those offices are going to appear to major, major upheaval right now, and we're losing a lot of capacity. Secondly, your comment about our urban areas being centered on biodiversity hotspots. I currently work in a conservation authority with a reconstructed Iroquoian village that had once stood there in the 14th, uh, 1400s, 15th century. And I take kids around the, the ecosystems there every day and, and show them natural ecosystems as productive resource spaces. So it goes to the other point that you mentioned about um, strategically implementing restoration on marginal agricultural areas that are less economically productive. And so this goes to my question of if we strategically restore areas and then as protected areas sort of spin an economic uh, use to it in terms of a very, very limited and sustainable harvest of non-timber forest products. Do you know of any existing success stories um, where people are doing those kind of sustainable harvest of specifically non-timber, and I'm going beyond maple syrup to potophyll and peltatum for cancer medicine, um, all, all kinds of things like that. Are there any good news, uh, things that you're aware of out there? I have to say that I don't know of any examples of that kind of thing having been successful. One of the difficulties we run into, first let me say, I think the barriers to biodiversity conservation across much of southern Canada are primarily, um, they arise primarily because we prefer to ignore the problem rather than just make it part of our day-to-day -day business. And the obstacles to achieving considerable success are really, really small. Uh, it's just a matter of taking five minutes at the end of every discussion and then adding biodiversity to that conversation. In terms of sustainable extraction, um, we know that it's viable and has been successful in some tropical systems. The difficulty that we run into is that um, unchecked, some industrial interests will then uh, kind of take a short-term liquidation <coughs> approach to managing those resources. And that needs to be something that's avoided in taking taking on that kind of sustainable extraction. Obviously, that's not, by definition, that would not be an extrainable, a sustainable approach. In southern Canada, is this, you know, th this is an interesting question, and quite frankly, I don't know the answer. Uh, it would be really interesting to me 
if anybody had examples of this from the highly developed southern parts of the country uh, that could be cited as examples to promote conservation. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe give those poor colleagues of yours something useful to do. It's completely depressing. Hi, Dr. Kerr. Um, Karen Kraft Sloan, and I want to thank you for uh, this fantastic articulate presentation. Um, I know you're trying to put a positive spin on it, but I'm going to go and cry after um, I leave the session. Um, I'm a big promoter of the citizen science movement and practice, and I'm a volunteer member of an advisory board that's creating the Ontario Water Centre for innovation, learning and research on the shores of Lake Simcoe and the community of Georgina. And we're looking at envisioning Lake Simcoe and its watershed as a living laboratory. And I had raised the idea of um, creating um, a program <coughs> to promote citizen science uh, within the watershed and within the activities under the water centre. And I was um, um, sort of challenged at one of our meetings by an individual who said, if the public takes this up, then the government will just point to it as another example of where, if we don't do it, you guys will do it, you know. Um, and they'll, they, they'll more easily walk away from um, some of these dismemberments, as you're calling it. So that's one question. Um, and secondly, um, even though I am a tremendous proponent of the citizen science movement and for many of the reasons that you've talked about, there is one question that I have is how do you encourage rigor in the monitoring? And if people are only looking at the things they care about, you know, whether it's <coughs> butterflies or a certain species of bird, what happens to all the other critters? that Dr. Ray talked about this morning that we don't necessarily think about. Right, so in the first instance, I think that, you know, we have, we have to recognize that citizen science endeavors like e-butterfly or e-bird, these are not going to replace the roles of entities like the experimental lakes area. They have no such potential. There is no way that's going to happen. What they do is they develop a broad base of people who are interested in aspects of the natural world, and those people vote. Now what we really need to do is start really hardcore conservation or citizen science projects in swing ridings. <laughs> One of the things I would say is that um, we've been hoping to begin a rational dialogue with uh, certain segments of the current policymaking community, and uh, that, that's been a total failure. Uh, rational dialogue is not part of what this, what's going on right now. Uh, Fact-based thinking is irrelevant, um, but they understand power. And I think we need to stop playing softball and uh, join the big leagues. And that, that's going to require us to change the approach. Now, we, we need to be unequivocal in demanding that things we care about change. And it could be that we will not be on the winning side of that conversation, but I'm quite happy to go down fighting on this issue. Um, we, we cannot replace what government does, and that is probably one of the first things that we should say in beginning citizen science endeavors. But we can make contributions distinct from those Thanks, uh, Ms. Sloan. I really appreciate that remark. In terms of your second uh, question, and I think you're, you're absolutely right, and, and Dr. Ray is right, uh, that diversity is not just the charismatic megavertebrates uh, or the honorary vertebrates like butterflies. You can't really go to entomology conferences and talk about butterflies because people just, they view you with such contempt. Uh, they're, they're honorary birds. Um, so, it's, it's really difficult for me. I go to these meetings like, yeah, yeah, it's a beetle, okay, whatever. 
And they look at us like, yeah, yeah, it's not even an insect. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> but th these are beautiful, charismatic animals, and they're vehicles for us to communicate more effectively with the public. They let us engage citizens that we would have a hard time engaging if we were talking about carotid beetles. I mean, variations on a theme of, you know, small, black, dwells under the grass kind of things. Um, they're very important, and no ecologist would argue that these things don't matter. But they're not great public relations tools. Um, what we have to do is make sure that whatever our citizen science tools do, that we have a quantitative understanding of what the ancillary benefits of conservation might prove to be for other groups of species. So if we set aside areas to conserve prairie species because we've done some work on butterflies, what are the benefits for other species in terms of making those efforts? We have to understand the implications downstream in terms of those the umbrella effect uh, of, of taking these kinds of flagship approaches. But I, I, I understand your, your perspective on this issue and I agree with you on this point also. It's, it's a whole, but I think we have a hard time mobilizing active interest. And weirdly in the UK, um, there are naturalists who have been observing small black beetles in their backyard for the past century. They're just weird. <laughs> but, but in Canada, this is not such an easy thing for us to, to make the case for. And if we begin with butterflies, maybe we can continue with bumblebees. That's something I'm talking about with Sheila right now. And if we get on with bumblebees, perhaps then we can start doing tiger beetles. A bit more exciting. So there are other ways we can proceed, uh, but we have nothing but progress ahead of us, I think. Hi, I'm uh, Catherine Bain, and uh, I'm an equal opportunity government basher. So I'm a little curious as to why you don't address the uh, Bill 55 uh, where the Endangered Species Act was modified without any public input. And, the, well, the whole rest of the thing is just at rife. The, at the with, province of Ontario level? Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, mean, I haven't The federal that government is. actually deputizes to, in most instances, enforcement by the provinces. So, and in some... Um, uh, domains. They don't even have jurisdiction. It is a provincial matter. And yeah. here we are with the Endangered Species Act being all but useless. Yeah, the changes to the Provincial Endangered Species Act would enable um, a government not intent on conservation to impose exceptions in almost every case. It's a very dangerous array of amendments, and I agree with you. I didn't address it for time reasons, but also because um, there are responses that are in the works uh, to this. I have seen some of them, I'm just not able to do everything in this particular issue. I have not particularly engaged with in the last several weeks, but I agree with you completely. It's really important. My understanding is that it may have emanated not at a political level, but from, from somewhere in the depths of government. Um, there has been a lot of trouble implementing the ESA, and there are some blemishes in terms of the way it has antagonized private landowners in southern Ontario, um, that's, that's an issue that I think can be resolved without undermining the legislation, and that's something I would strongly oppose. I, do you have any documentation available? On I'd be happy to chat with you about it. Um, the people to talk to about this, from my very Ottawa-based perspective, are actually at the Institute of the Environment at the University of Ottawa, particularly people like Stuart Algy, who's got a very insider's perspective on exactly how this legislation was written. So we're, we're still in the, the midst of trying to understand what the intent of this was, um, but it's certainly not a development that's likely to have beneficial conservation consequences. No, in fact, I don't think it does very much for the uh, citizen science and stewardship initiatives because there are people that, who have been interested in protecting particular endangered species who are now finding themselves blindsided. They have no, no backup. Yes, yeah, very frustrating. I'm hoping this may change. Last question. With all due respect to the citizen science movement, let me suggest that uh, working in silos is not going to solve the problem. And I appreciate your response to this. I think what we need to do is get rid of the silos, and we need to form more cooperative 
ventures that bring together people who share the same concerns, put them together into groups that will pressure government to act in response to our needs <coughs> instead of their needs. And so I really would recommend that uh, we reach out to broader communities, engage them in a discussion about their needs and how they may parallel our needs and how we can work together to solve problems. I think that's an excellent point. The, uh, the idea of silos and solitudes in the Canadian context is a long-standing one and one that I view as, as being partially addressed by citizen science rather than citizen science contributing to that segregation of parts of the population. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed in the month and a half that the Sea Butterfly Initiative has been live is that it has engaged all segments of society, with little kids, um, industrial interests, it's engaged the ENGO community, the naturalists are very engaged. It's, it's really a broadly based kind of thing and it is entirely non-exclusive. So it isn't limited in the sense that anybody is able to join it and participate in it and use the material that we publish entirely openly for any purpose they wish. So it's, it's something which doesn't lend itself to the kind of silo idea that I understand uh, is very important because it has no walls and it has no doors. All it's got is open windows and open doors. So we've tried to make it as accessible as possible. The idea of building a very broadly based response to trends uh, that we see here and internationally, I think is vital. And my, my feeling and my early observation is that one of the many things that can contribute to that broad dialogue that engages society in general is citizen science. But I don't think that should be viewed as something which increases um, or decreases communications among different segments. It's something that throws open doors, doesn't close them. Let me be clear that I don't disagree with you and I wasn't trying to be critical of a citizen scientist. I was merely saying that my sense is that what we need is evidence-based decision-making on a broad scale. And that involves science, it involves Absolutely. prisons, it involves military spending, it involves a whole host of topics. A lot of other people out there who share our concerns who we could bring to the common cause if we worked out. Here, here.